Uh, I'm at one, nine. One second, I'll just take. Too many people enter into unhappy relationships or exploited relationships because they're unable to know how much pleasure they will be able to derive from that relationship. We prefer a world where humans can measure the amount of pleasure they will experience in a relationship before entering it. Firstly, some characterization. We think that pleasure in this case includes emotional joy, sexual pleasure, and the joy of self-actualization and fulfillment, and the amount of it depends on both the intensity and the amount of pleasure you're able to experience. Also, we think if you experience pain, that takes away from the total amount of pleasure you experience. So if you ex experience a lot of emotional pain, your uh, metric for pleasure could be negative. Because you are entering into a relationship, we also think this relationship most likely will be a, rela a romantic relationship. Also, we believe that people will enter relationships with high amounts of pleasure because now they have a concrete metric they can look at and people will like to likely to maximize pleasure. And lastly, we want to uh, make note that there is an element of reciprocity here and that both partners have the ability to access this metric. Both partners can choose. So there is unlikely to be a situation uh, of abuse where one partner derives a lot of pleasure where the other person derives very little pleasure. We think of the, if a person has, sees that they will be, be deriving a very little pleasure from this relationship, they will not enter it. So we don't, so there's an element of reciprocity in here. So two things in my speech today. Firstly, I want to talk about how this helps relationships. And secondly, I want to talk to you about why uh, evaluating a relationship on a utilitarian metric is a valid way of evaluating it. Firstly, on helping relationships, we think that this helps people build informed choices. We think that people in this scenario will know how much utility they will be able to get out of a relationship. And then there's one more factor uh, I'll take you later. Use. And that overall, we think it makes for a more informed choice when you enter a relationship because you have more metrics by which you can evaluate this relationship. You have better expectations going into that relationship. And overall, we think it'll make you uh, have better choices. Uh, yeah, I'll take you uh, for seal. Yeah, so given that individuals experience pleasure differently, how is this calculation going to take place and how are individuals going to access this calculation? So I'm so essentially, I think it is fair to fiat that like essentially the like how much pleasure you experience is dependent on the individual, right? So like basically, whether this is a, tech, is a technology or an ability, this uh, this uh, technology or ability will be specific to that one individual, in that the amount of pleasure you derive is based on the individual's preferences. We think that is basically uh, very valid. Okay, so why do we think this will lead to better relationships? Firstly, we think we achieve self-actualization a lot faster and that is essentially, usually if you want to find the right partner, it takes a lot of time. This takes the guesswork out of it. Essentially, you're gonna have a better relationship sooner in your life. We think that is a net good. We think it'll lead to a better relationship and better like a self of better for the individual in five ways. Firstly, in terms of realistic expectations, we think people would know exactly how much pleasure they should be able to get out of a relationship. So therefore, you'll be going into this relationship with a realistic expectations for how, many, how much pleasure they will be able to get out of it. So essentially, now we don't have unrealistic expectations in that when you go into a relationship at first, you expect a lot from your partner. But essentially, if you have this, uh, counter, like, this counterbalancing like, metric, we think that your, your expectations so it's going to be a lot more realistic and this contributes to the partner dynamics and contributes to a more stable long-term relationship where both partners know what they should expect and will be more content. Secondly, we think it will lead to less toxic and exploitative relationships. And this is a great problem in today's uh, in, in the status quo. Because when you uh, basically uh, firstly meet someone, you, it's unlikely you can tell that your relationship is going to be toxic or exploitative. A lot of toxic and exploitative relationships start out very, uh, very like normal. Like your partner could be very charming, but uh, it could end up being toxic and exploitative. And this reciprocity of the measure improves that because both partners have access to the access to this metric. They have, if they have low pleasure, they're able to unlikely to uh, enter these relationships. And if you have a toxic and exploitative relationship, they're unlikely to have a high measure of this metric.
So this, in this way, we help people avoid toxic and exploited relationships, and we think that is a net good. And sec thirdly, on feminism, we think that basically this uh, metric provides a counterbalancing narrative to the existing societal norms and expectations for women. Because when they look at these relationships, if there is not good for themselves, we don't think that these women will enter these relationships. We think it provides, the, the metric is counterbalancing in terms of what society expects of women and what women want for themselves. So we think this, this is important and that it drives, uh, drives forward the cause of feminism and will make the uh, expect society, uh, uh, will counterbalance the societal expectations for women. And fourthly, unlike, for instance, uh, sexual minorities or LGBTQ, we believe that this metric will help people discover their sexuality and who they will be happy with. Essentially, like if, you, uh, if you're unsure about your sexuality, you can look at partner, potential partners and you can look at potential pleasure you can derive from these partners. And we think that will be a great help in terms of determining your sexuality and determining who you actually want to be. We think that is a net good for the sexual minorities as well. And lastly, we think it avoids short-term and unstable relationships and that it drives people towards long, stable long-term relationships that will support them. Because in long-term relationships, you're able to derive a greater amount of net pleasure. And we think that it is important because long-term relationships bring stability into your life. It basically gives you a support structure that is robust when you encounter problems in life. And we think that is a net good as well. So for all of these reasons, we think it will be a uh, net good for in terms of like helping relationships and people be able to derive more pleasure. Then, why do we think this is a justified metric using a utilitarian metric? Because opposition might come up and say that it is invalid to measure human relationships in terms of how much pleasure and pain you're able to derive from them because human dignity is above that. Why do we think then using a utilitarian metric is justified? Firstly, you're not using humans solely as a means to an end. Like for instance, you use humans as a means to an end when you're buying tickets, but you're not using them solely as a means to an end where you chain them to that and then you're only buying tickets from them. If you're not respecting the other person as a human being, you're unlikely to be there driving pleasure. So we think that like it is unlikely in this situation people will be solely using other people as a means to an end. And secondly, we think having a pleasurable relationship is a basis to self-actualization. If you don't have a pleasurable experience, it is unlikely you derive higher goods from a relationship. And lastly, we think happiness matters. Happiness is the most concrete good someone could get, be able to require, acquire and could meaningfully improve someone's life. Happiness matters in relationships. For all of these reasons, proud to propose. Thank you for uh, inviting the leader of OP. Does we matter if you know everything that is going to happen? Do you make any meaningful choice anymore if your choice is bound to have no failure? On side opposition, we believe that we, we should have even if the relations are bad, we should still endure them. We should still go through them because these, this is how humans grow. This is how you have meaning in your relationships. We oppose. What did the prime minister tell you? They have told you they can get rid of guesswork. There's going to be less toxic relationship. They avoid short-term unstable relationships. And they use a, both a utilitarian, utilitarian metric and a deontological metric to measure their thing. First question then comes is about their model, right? They say that they can measure pleasure because of emotional joy fulfillment and pain deduces it. The question then becomes, if a person gets a number 10 and the num person becomes a number five, how are you going to weigh the two things? Because if it's going to be a multivariable thing, on opposition side, we especially don't believe you can quantify the, um, the relationship you're going to have a person with into a number. Three questions in this debate then. Number one, is the metric of numerically measuring pleasure wrong? Number two, does this worsen the pe relationship people are in? And number three, what does this mean to meaningful relationship? On to our first constructive argument. The first thing is pleasure is entirely arbitrary and subjective. And the you cannot use a net number to measure a relationship. Even if you can use a net number to use to measure a relationship, people will be preemptively opting out of a relationship because they are feeling less happiness. And the impact of this is threefold. Number one, there's going to be less pleasure and there's going to be um, less quality that these relationships can provide. And there's going to be no new relationship as, and so far as um, you can find out who you like or who you want to be, right? But number two, this is going to dramatically worsen 
the relationships in which people are in them right now. Because what essentially you are doing is, is you're associating your mood with a number. The relationship you're having right now, if you're looking at somebody, you look at them, they're a two. You might be having a, a good time right now, but because you're constantly doubting the relationship you're in, you're looking at him, you're questioning yourself, will this person start abusing me tomorrow? Why is it that this number is so low? And therefore, you no longer interact with them normally. You're always paranoid in the relationship. We don't think that is how you should deal with the relationship you cannot the second thing is you can no longer live in a meaningful instant moment you cannot you cannot go into a, you cannot make a decision right now and you cannot make a decision in which you be, just for the moment you always have to look for the entire relationship you have to look oh will this thing give me pleasure so on so on right number three is uh, side government has told us that somehow this is going to increase human dignity in some sense right we say that is principally wrong because by putting a number with a person that you're going to be with you are essentially objectifying and degrading the people that they are people with a one it's this is not true right if, even if this person is a one opposition side believe that you can still this person can still give you a meaningful relationship through different different um obstacles different challenges we'll explain it in my next argument right but Essentially, this objectification and the degradation of numerically categorizing a person is an assault on human dignity. And we don't believe this it should be a right thing and government side needs to justify this. But lastly, the most important argument for coming from side opposition is that learning experiences and meaningful relationship do not necessarily correlate with pleasure. What does this look like? Your mother or your teacher, let's say, or it could be a romantic partner, when they are teaching you things, when you are learning a lesson, for example, this is not necessarily going to be the most pleasurable thing. When somebody is being very annoying and you are not being pleasured, sometimes you're not experiencing that much pleasure. Sometimes the problem lies not within the other person, but sometimes the problem lies within yourself. The, the problem then with government's case is that now you cannot meaningfully self-reflect because every person you go, is go you're, you're just gonna, oh, the problem is with them. Therefore, I'm not going to be with a relationship with them. Therefore, I'm going to be with a, someone who is going to perfectly fit with this person. What this ends up with is people do not self-improve. People are not as tolerant as other uh, for other people. People don't know what their flaws in their characters are. People don't know how they can develop to be more tolerant to other people. That means that on net, the government side is going to have less tolerant people who stay in their own little echo chambers of relationship. They can only tolerate the people that kind of do something bad. An example of this could be a drug addict, right? They're, they're the, perhaps the most, the relationship that is most compatible to them is another drug addict that is going to accept their drug usage and doses, right? But we say sometimes a relationship not necessarily brings pressure through this person. Maybe you have to go to someone that is willing to help them, though he's going to go through a lot of pleasure, although he's going to go through a lot of pain, at the end, he's going to come out as a better person. He's going to make, he's going to learn lessons. He's going to be, develop his character, right? So, um, what, what has, what has the government side provided to you? The government side has provided to you to a very materialistic and an objective way to measure human relationship when, when we on opposition side don't believe the case, don't believe this is the case, right? Uh, the second, my partner is going to give, give explanation, detailed explanation on how any sort of foresight in, in your life do not mean, do not make your life any more meaningful and the, um, and the, and your life on net is going to have less purpose yet, All right? So on a utilitarian, even if on a utilitarian metric, why do we still beat government, All right? Government says you can have more pleasure in this relationship. Yes, even if you can have this more pleasure in the relationship, we say that so long as you're not improving as a person, so long as you cannot get better, so long as through the troubles and hardship that the government so easily discarded, dismissed as guesswork. If you cannot grow as a person in on net relationships that are not romantic, something that you must go to the workplace, you must go to the workplace, you're going to experience more troubles, you're going to experience more pain in 
places you're going to go to and you're going to you're going to not instead of reflecting on your own self instead of reflecting on your own actions you're going to be blaming other people because they don't give you a high enough number because their number is not high enough and you're going to go to your own group of people that have higher number that could treat you better we believe that um the failures from choice is what gives it meaning so proud to oppose Thank you for that, DPM, to continue with the properties. Um, for POIs, I prefer, um, what do I prefer? I prefer, I prefer in the text because I might not hear, um, like, the, like if you, can, I'm 2% two, two can you, can you hear? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to begin in three, two, one. A lot of OO's points talk about really grand impacts without really explaining the mechanization behind them, right? Because when OO talks about how learning lessons don't necessarily give the most pleasure and you have to be in a terrible relationship in order to derive a, like a lot of life lessons from it, we don't really know why you have to opt into a terrible relationship in order to experience these you know, like learning lessons. We don't really know why you have to, you know, go through years of torture in order to act, like just derive a very small lesson that you probably aren't going to use later in life. We're proud to propose. First, I'm going to talk about rebuttals. And then second of all, I'm going to talk more onto why self-actualization matters uh, and why self-actualization happens and why it matters on our side and who it impacts. Okay, first of all, rebuttals. The first thing they say is that you can't quantify this metric. We can just feed out this, right? Like if, if this metric wasn't able to be quantified, then prop wouldn't just exist at all right i'm pretty sure this motion is pretty theoretical in that it, it like it it's it dreams up of a world in which we can actually opt into this so we think we can just be out this the second thing he said is oh this is going to be unique to every person as to what qualities they value we don't know why that's a problem if like obviously i might be a one to someone but i might be a ten to someone else because we just prefer different things right i don't know why that's a problem the third thing they say you can no longer live in a meaningful moment. First of all, I don't know why sporadic moments where you don't know what happens are necessarily good. They never really made that connection. But second of all, note the wording in the motion where it says this house prefers a world in which humans can measure the amount of pleasure, right? So let's say I really value what OO is saying, right? In that they, uh, they're saying, oh, there's, there's, there's a beauty in sporadic moments. If I want to enter sporadic moments, I do not have to measure the amount of pleasure I'll experience in a relationship, right? It's just the choice of whether or not I want to. This already co-ops a fair amount of what OO says. Okay, the, uh, another thing they said is that a person with a one might provide, you know, good use and we shouldn't relegate people with ones to, you know, the bottom echelons of society, right? Okay, we agree. A person with a one, just because they are a one, doesn't necessarily mean they are a one to the entirety of society, right? It doesn't mean they're incapable of relationships. Given that both OG and OO agree on this, and that humans are pretty multifaceted and unique, we think that people that are ones are probably not going to be ones for every other single person in society. They're probably going to be a 10 to people that share their values. And precisely because of everything that Danny told you, and that you can find other people that share mutually similar characteristics as yourself, you probably aren't going to be a one to those people either. Okay, the most important thing they say is that learning lessons don't necessarily get the most pleasure and that you need to opt into bad relationships or at least, you know, sporadic relationships where you don't necessarily know the outcome in order to learn, um, in order to learn these life lessons and that, you know, oh, these lessons come from strife. 
First of all, I don't know why you have to be in a terrible relationship to learn. You can also be in great relationships and learn from that. In fact, like I think humans in general uh, like value positive learning experiences far more than negative learning experiences, right? In that, for instance, a lot of teachers incorporate you know positive learning experiences into their own studies, and that they you know don't really like uh, like force their students to you know study every day, right? And stuff like that. Second of all. I think that you can, like, if you really value what OO tells you to do, you can opt into a relationship with a one if you want to. If you are really a minority, uh, uh, like a minority like uh, type of person that values negative experiences in order for you to learn and that you value, you know, the torture that you will endure and derive some sort of lesson from that, I think that you can just opt into a relationship with another person that's a one if you want to do that. Third of all, you don't need to turn this like sort of device on if you don't want to, right? You don't need to, you know, say that, oh, I'm going to measure every other person because of the wording that of the motion in which you can measure the amount of pleasure if you want to. So if you don't want to measure the pleasure don't, uh, uh, of others, and if you value, you know, like sporadic relationships or negative relationships in which you don't derive any sort of pleasure out of it, you don't have to turn on that sort of like device, right? But fourth of all, my extension that I'm gonna to get to just a bit later on is going to rebut this on how you actually learn more from these experiences. The last thing they say is you won't break out of your bubble and you won't really be you know, exposed to a lot of other people. We don't really know that why that's bad. Like why do you conform to what society wants you to be? Why do you conform to society's you know, like, uh, like, like ideas of uh, just uh, like a perfect person that's a 10? And if I'm generally antisocial or generally don't have good uh, uh, have qualities that you know the majority of people value, like let's say I'm really interested into you know niche hobbies, I don't know why I have to change that sort of stuff. Okay, now let's talk about why self-actualization occurs. So for people that want to better their score and have better relationships, they will have means of analyzing themselves and knowing what is good or bad with them, right? In that they can clearly see areas of improvement and see what makes their score up and down, which means that if I deliberately change myself to be, you know, more hardworking, more selfless, more compassionate, and more of a, I don't know, more of a leader, for instance, nicer, brave, etc., and I measure the amount of pleasure others will gain from me um, before and after this change, I can probably very easily see which qualities I need to work on. Okay, given that as a clarification, I'll take CEO. Okay. Given that mind. the motion only, given that the motion only says that you're going to calculate pleasure, what is this analysis jargon that you're talking about? Why is this like fiat? What? Okay. I, I think that amount of pleasure. I, I I really doubt that the fact that like pleasure in this instance only means like sexual, right? Like I think that like you derive like a fair amount of emotional pleasure in a relationship. And and okay, I'm just gonna continue. I don't really get that POI. Okay, so if I deliberately change myself to be like more hardworking and more selfless, and I measure the amount of pleasures others will gain from me before and after, I can probably see which qualities I need to work on. This can't happen in a status quo because it's very hard to pinpoint what is wrong with the person, right? And that usually others don't know what is good or bad about you and what makes a relationship good or bad. Like, why is this, right? We think that feels like sociology and psychology and stuff like that, which are very robust, are developed solely to give you insight onto who you are as a person, so just the MBTI test, right? And also, so, so like sometimes others don't even want to tell you the bad qualities that you have, and that they prefer not to be honest or prefer that being honest would further degrade this relationship. So what sort of qualities are, do we think that people are going to be able to use to develop, um, you know, like better, uh, to, to make themselves better uh, people, right? We think generally good qualities that improve relationships, such as compassion and hard work, etc. If I, you know, if I become more compassionate and see my score raises from an eight to a nine, I know that that is an area that I need to work on. And I know that is an area that people generally value and that, that I can use to become a better person. Okay, why is this important? Three things. First of all, we think that like you should have a right to access better personality qualities, right? Just, just as you have the freedom to access things in general, such as freedom of speech, expression, et cetera, you should have the right to access a better version of yourself. Second of all, it helps relationships because of everything Danny said, because self-actualization helps people to improve themselves with qualities that relationships find to be good. But third of all, we think this impact doesn't only extend to romantic relationships, right? It extends to every relationship. And that honesty and bravery are qualities that everyone values. And if you want to emotionally benefit someone in a relationship, those same qualities that provide emotional benefit to your partner are qualities that can probably benefit other relationships as well. Okay. Um, it also allows yourself to benefit because of like things like hard work and perseverance, et cetera, are values that are good for your own personal problems. We're proud to propose. Thank you for that. Do you know to wrap up the upper house? Hi, can everyone hear me if I talk like this? Yep, yep. 
Um, cool. For POI preferences, I prefer verbal POIs. Pretty bad looking at the chat. But I guess you can also text in the chat. So like whatever works for you, honestly. It's cool. Just as long as you don't badger, I should be pretty chill about it. Cool. Um, I'm going to wait for someone to exit the bathroom and walk into this room before I start, if that's OK. By BPM. Cool, great. My speech will start in three, two, one. The problem of opening government is I don't really know what the fuck their case is. Let's assume Mason and I are in a relationship. The pleasure score I get from being in a relationship with Mason is a score of five. Okay, what does that mean for my qualities? Why is it a score of five? What do we do that leads to the pleasure score of five? It is unclear as to what any of that means. As a result of that, I don't think you exercise any of the introspection shit opening government goes for because I just don't know how you get there insofar as the number really doesn't tell you jack shit about anything. I'm going to answer two questions in this debate. Number one, why you harm relationships. Number two, why pleasure in and of itself as a numerical value is a bad metric. I'm also going to talk about the principle that DPM conveniently drops. First question, why do you harm relationships? I'm going to talk about five things under here. All of these things directly clash with opening government to prove to you why the most vulnerable actor that they wanted to solve actually becomes far worse off on their side of the house. Number one, why do exploitative relationships become far worse? This flips their argument on social movements and women. Here's the problem, because on their side of the house, the number is a holistic indicator of the overall pleasure you get within a relationship. That's to say, if maybe in one instance, I abuse my girlfriend and I do not get their consent and therefore I sexually assault her, as long as I can offset that by buying her a lot of things, for example, then that score necessarily will not be super low. It would either be average or above average. What then is the problem with that? The problem then is that number then becomes used as an expectation point and therefore you further entrench things like the Stockholm syndrome. That is to say, the woman or the man or any vulnerable individual that exists within an asymmetry of power within a relationship now will internalize and tell themselves, oh, he or she is treating me poorly in this relationship now. But surely because our pleasure score is high, it means that it ought to get better. As a result of that, you create an entrenched norm in which you tell individuals that they ought to stick in relationships because the number that is almighty because of the gut fiat opening government goes for tells them that things will get better and things will be happy. And as a result of that, it becomes far harder for individuals to ever leave relationships. The comparative on our side of the house is some degree of that Stockholm syndrome might still exist, but at least there's an easier way for you to opt out of it. Because to the point where there's visceral harm thrown at you, you say, fuck it, I'm out, it's really painful. The comparative is you stick to that metric and say, things will get better. Therefore, it's far harder to opt out of relationships. The second thing to know is even if that's not true, I think you also get less help from victims as a whole. Because here's the problem. Opening government tries to skew out of this debate by saying, oh, you have a choice in deciding whether or not you want to do this number. But to the point in which it is so powerful as opening government talks about, and oftentimes people do want to know their own fate, I think what ends up happening is you get a social pressure that forces individuals to use this. To the point in which that is the case, you get a double bind. Either everyone is forced to use this, and therefore you take away the individual agency and dignity that Mason talks about. Therefore, it in and of itself is a principle wrong because it's a coercive choice, or it isn't a coercive choice, but because there's an expectation that everyone ought to use it. When individuals enter abusive relationships and therefore they're assaulted and raped, people say, oh, it was your problem because you didn't use this mechanism. You never used this, and therefore that was why you entered horrible relationships. Therefore, you get less support networks and less help for victims as a whole. That's why abusive and exploitative relationships become far worse on their side of the house. This flips their biggest impact. Number two, I think you also get worse relationships to the point in which you end up judging a book by its cover. Mason's argument, which Brian did not respond to, was to say you get less opt into relationships in general because to the point in which the pleasure score is really low, I now will say, ah, maybe that person isn't for me without ever knowing that person because that person has a score of three as opposed to a score of five, for example. What then is the harm to this? Twofold. Number one, Mason told you why people with systemically lower scores are just going to get locked out of relationships. And this is going to be really, really bad, right? Because it's probably going to be like ugly people, for example, or just vulnerable people who now can never find love and never find longing. That in and of itself is wrong insofar as it is important for individuals to find longing because humans are social animals. But second, and the more important impact is to the point in which you get less opt-in, I think you also get less meaningful relationships. Because note here that the preferences of individuals are oftentimes not rigid. That's to say, my preference two years ago, my preferences two months ago, is very different from my preferences now. The way as to doubt how that preference is formed, which oftentimes dictate how we get pleasure, is based on our interactions with individuals. So because I dated one of Brian's friends, and I recognized that it was not a great decision because she was emotionally unavailable, I'm able to learn which individual gives me more pleasure and reevaluate the relationship preferences that I have. I never can do that to the point in which I don't opt into relationships with low pleasure scores in the first place. So on our side, 
that it helps we get far more rationality to inform decisions and therefore individuals are probably going to be better off because they can better form their preferences and therefore in turn better decide what relationships and what qualities they want to look for they can never do that when a number of two immediately turns them off from any relationship so we get that better on our side of the house as well no thank you number three I would also say it's better on our side of the house to the point in which the relationship dynamics are better because Mason gave you this and DPM did not respond to it. We told you two things. Number one, you oftentimes will create paranoia to the point in which you might be really, really happy now, but the pleasure score that was shown on this machine is lower than the perceived happiness you're feeling. To that end, you question yourself. You say, oh, what if something shitty happens tomorrow? What is going to happen? Why is this person lying to me? And as a result of that, you create paranoia in your head. And as a result of that, you likely cannot enjoy the moments now. And second of all, you just create less trust and create more toxic relationships to the point in which that asymmetry exists. Because you're like, oh, maybe he's going to like assault me tomorrow. Maybe he's going to like be cheating on me tomorrow. As a result of that, you can't meaningfully engage in happy relationships. The comparative is maybe there's less certainty, but it's still going to be better to the point in which you probably can be happier because you're not constantly thinking about these paranoid thoughts. Reason number four, I think the meaning of life oftentimes comes in the serendipitous encounters that individuals have. So failure and like the inability to find love immediately is probably a good thing. This engages the metric on why you need to find love immediately. Three reasons why. Number one, because the love on our side will always be better when you're able to more rationally form the preferences and decide what you meaningfully want. You can't do that when you preemptively opt out of relationships. Number two, oftentimes there's beauty in the journey, right? So like I've dated a lot of people and like I've been left a lot of times, but the beauty in that is at one point I'm able to joke with my friends and talk about it. There's also a feeling of satisfaction when I think I find the right person who I am with now because I think maybe that person is going to be here to stay but number three also recognize the best case on their side of the house is bad because you get let net less happiness because the problem here is you create a hedonistic treadmill to the point in which if you always opt into relationships of sevens at one point that seven then ends up becoming like a two or it feels like a two because you don't think you get any net happiness as a whole the comparative on our side of the house is probably better because you might not be with the person that gives you the most amount of pleasure but that juxtaposing feeling and the perception that life in and of itself is a roller coaster and you never know what to expect is important because it further enlightens and further emphasizes your happy moments by contrasting with the sad moments so it's better off on our side of the house House. Number five, I also think you get less introspection on their side of the house. They say like, oh, you can learn more. Don't really think that's the case because like, I don't know what the five tells me about leadership qualities. Also, if they say people won't tell you what your qualities are, that's symmetric. So I don't know how you're going to learn. Also, if their argument is that it's like a multivariable thing, then like it always changes depending on who you're dating. So I don't think they get their argument. If anything, you end up using the number to say, ah, it's their fault because their numbers are low. So therefore you get less introspection on their side of the house. Finally, then briefly, why is pleasure a bad metric? We said it was a bad metric because it's subjective and arbitrary and it was objectifying to individuals. That's a principle wrong that they are yet to beat down. But more crucially, we say even if they can do it, because they probably can because of gut via, it oftentimes ignores small nuances because it creates an overwhelming number that is attached to the entirety of the relationship rather than small experiences. Therefore, you get less meaning to the point in which you neglect these small nuances. So you're unable to derive happiness and feeling from those small nuances for all those relationships and for all the love built for opening up. Thank you for that, inviting the dolphin member to start with the lower house. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Starting in three, two, one. Listen to the language of opening opposition. Because opening opposition tells you that you should tell minorities, tell women who has been raped and gaslighted that they should think of the agency of other people before they can exert their own agency. We think this particular agency that OO talks about is one that can never be imposed uniformly because the way we construct societies have always been that male and that, that the patriarchy owes a disproportionate hold over, similarly, uh, over similar concepts of agency. We don't think that your ability to exercise your agency to protect your Yourself should always be one that is packed to what other people's agency might or might not be at this particular instance. But also, if agency is a metric by which we value this debate, then clearly the case in opening opposition was uncomparative because he needs to deal with why they get more agency on your side, given that nobody can access this mechanism of protection. We think comparatively, more people are able to use this particular metric, and that's why we are able to win. 
I'm going to ask four questions in this speech. Number one, why DLO was lying through his ass. Second, I'm going to talk to you about why in principle self-defense is the more important value. Third, I want to say how we guarantee security. Note that if we guarantee security, that's an objective and not a subjective metric that OO thinks this debate is about. And lastly, I'm going to talk about why minorities are able to be more enfranchised in love. This directly clashes with the OO's point on why minorities will be locked out. So responding to the previous speaker, the previous speaker says this is a bad thing for agency because right when you do something uh, everybody get pressurized to do something like guys that's an option for you not being able to use any recourse because some people will be locked out you shouldn't be able to sue your 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 your, your perpetrator because some other people cannot sue your perpetrator this is strange but if it is true that you are coerced into making this choice then you similarly can't make the argument that there are some people and some minorities that will not be able to use this and therefore victim blaming happens. Because if you say that victim have victim blaming become, uh, happens because some people don't use this technology, then you cannot simultaneously claim that it's coercive and everybody will use it. So either there is strong coercion in which case everybody uses it and that cancels out your point on victim blaming or it is the case that some people don't use it. I think if it's the first, then your biggest impact is washed. If it's the second, that some people truly get hurt, then your argument on agency is lost. And then we think that the agency to protect yourself, more people are able to protect themselves. That is a net good. The last thing I want to talk about, which is the OO strategy. If I say that women get victim blame, I win. Bro, women are going to be victim blame on both sides. The question is that your solution is retroactive. Your solution is that you should let them get raped and then later we have support structures. Our policy means women don't opt into their relationship in the first place. There's less instances of that rape even happening to begin with. So on comparative, we would rather not have support structures. We would rather not have retroactive recourse if it means that people don't place themselves in that hurt to begin with. We think prevention is always a greater priority than cure. So if we have a mechanism that allows us to guarantee protection, we will prioritize that protection over a speculative thing like because that we don't even know whether it will happen or not. We think that destroys the entire opening opposition's case. Number one, why do we prioritize self-defense? Here is where we think I want to give some credit to opening government. I think Danny and team did a very good job by telling you that you need to protect people from exploitation relationship. But what they don't give you is two things. Number one, they don't explain the process analysis by, in, by the, by, they don't give you the process analysis by which people protect themselves. And they don't actually ground this debate to demonstrate what the impact looks like for minority. This is what we're going to do in two ways. First in the principle and second in the outcome. So in the principle, why do we benefit or why do we prioritize self-defense? For one simple reason, because if OG and OO thinks that um, agency is abstract and we can't value it, I think there's one thing that we can value and that's called security. Why is security important? Because I think it is patronizing for you to suggest that you need to learn from relationships and it does not matter the hurt you face on, on the ground. The reason for this is because in status quo, we fetishize physical pain, but not emotional pain. So if you beat your spouse, you, the, the spouse has the ability to self-defend. Your spouse has the ability to lodge a police report. All these exist for physical harm. But when it comes to things like emotional gaslighting, when it comes from emotional abuse, people have no recourse to defend themselves from because it's hard to prove, because it's speculative, because it's abstract. This policy guarantees that people know that these harms are likely to be imposed on them. Them, allowing them a better ability to self-defend and safeguard themselves. But why is this important also is because what we suggest at this point in time is that the way in which we frame this argument of self-defense is that we need to allow individuals to be shielded from these emotional abusers in the status quo. We don't think we should only fetishize physical pain over all other considerations. Sorry, I got too much to talk about. My week will take a PY. The next thing I then want to talk about is how this affects like minorities. Here's what we want to say is that this policy affects people disproportionately. So some people have more agency in a relationship. In the world we live in today, women always get the shorter end of the state because the patriarchy dictates terms and conditions. In South Asia, we often tell women that your role is to be domesticated. There's a predominant stigma against like women in villages in India to go out and work, for example, or like, dom like they should play more domesticated roles. The highest amount of marital rape and the highest amount of domestic violence against women 
happens in these communities where you don't give them the agency to opt out. Look at the startlingly elitist language of the opening opposition. When they say you should discover yourself, we think some people can discover themselves. Ted can make himself a better person after failed relationships. Some women cannot because they feel mentally scarred after going through these ordeals. I think it's patronizing to say that you should think of other people. We think it's high time society thinks of them and not other people. But also this looks like the way we practice this for children and foster care. When foster cares are now able to make an informed decision of which parents, because this debate is not about relationship, the edge call clarifies also about other kinds of relationships, not just love. This means that people can make a decision about where to send kids, which foster home is more likely to love them, which foster home is more likely to care for their interests rather than abuse them. All of these things are more protected in a world where we allow these agencies to be affected. But third, why do we think like ugly people and minorities get more love under our side? That's because status quo is already biased. Women like to go for fuck boys and playboys who look good but don't treat them very well. On our side, we reverse this because this is a judge by the happiness that you can give the girl over existing predominant characteristics. Um, the opening opposition say, no, no, no. They will buy a lot of presents to cover up the fact that they raped the girl. This is them stupid because that presumes the woman value the presents more than the fact that she was okay. raped. I think one rape is more scarring than any PS4 that you can give your girlfriend. I think on comparative, it is patronizing to suggest that women cannot rationally access this mechanism because we protect minorities and women. We think that they deserve the most amount of protection. It is high time we stop pretending that we deserve to tell women how to feel and how to behave. Opposition member to start from the closing up. Yes, just a mic check. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, so uh, request please uh, restrict your POIs to chat box, to the chat box only. Um, thanks. I'll take just 10 seconds. I'll start. First, I'll lay the groundwork for some of the very important definitions and issues with this motion. Using them, I'll rebut some arguments of closing government and then I'll go on and give my own extensions for this debate. All right. First, uh, laying the groundwork. Panel, understand that we uh, agreed that the government has the fiat to assume that this pleasure can be measured, but there is absolutely no reason for us to believe that it can also be measured on a day to day basis, as in, you can be told just how much pleasure you will be getting on a day to day basis. Also, in retrospect, you can calculate at the end of the day just how much pleasure you've received from the day and just how much is left for you to receive in a relationship. Also, you cannot uh, you cannot pinpoint just how much pleasure you'll be getting from each and every action that you commit in a relationship as well. Also, understand that uh, in any relationship, equal amount of pleasure is not necessarily derived for both the parties involved, right? So, uh, so, and this technology only gives you the amount of pleasure you'll be getting. It cannot change that. We need to understand that people derive different amounts of pleasures in a relationship based on their past lived experiences, based on their own personal preferences. Therefore, this cannot be changed. This will be important when I come to my extensions, right? Uh, and also understand that uh, the fact that you've been giving, that you are being given uh, an amount, uh, a number for the pleasure that you're receiving does not uh, mean that you can use that you can uh, interpret it properly because understand that pleasure is relative. There has to be a base quantity based on which the numbers will be given to you, right? So understand that in order for this technology to be as effective as the government is arguing, people need to be able to understand the gravity of the situation as to just how much this number actually means for them. What does it translate to? Which they cannot be, uh, they cannot be possibly uh, expected to understand what it means. So these are some of the issues with this tech, which uh, either the uh, the web has to come and clarify for us or they or they are very ma big major issues which haven't been addressed up until this point right coming to the rebuttals to cg cg is pushing the worst burden on us taking the worst case scenario of highly abusive relationships abusive and exploitative relationships but you need to understand what they're that what they're giving to you is going to be highly and ineffective anyways right why is it going to be so because understand that toxic relationships are still going to exist in in either house uh, 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 toxic relationships are still going to exist why do toxic relationships uh, fall into the first place right understand that uh, when you're about to enter into a relationship that will become abusive in the future there are still a lot of red flags in them right you will see the person losing their temper and uh, 
coming on the verge of attacking you there are a lot of red flags that happen but you tend to ignore them why is it so because either you believe that okay it's fine this person was just not in the right mindset or you believe that you can change them right considering what i've established for you that you cannot uh, uh, you cannot possibly understand just how important and what the value of this pleasure number is you there is no reason for us to believe that people will just will take them seriously and opt out of such relationships they will also look at them as just one of those red flags and completely ignore them right also uh, when the clo- then when the government uh, talks about uh, how uh, in a patriarchal society when you don't give this technology women will continue to be oppressed and they will continue to be exploited understand that in a patriarchal society women aren't allowed to make any decisions uh, to begin with right what happens is this, uh, relationships are uh, decided for them they don't have a way to decide for themselves or opt out when it gets extremely hairy they cannot do that so considering that there is some technology how would you expect women to go ahead and be able to use it when they are continuously oppressed in the patriarchal society and they are not allowed to look for alternatives and opt out how does this opt out work out i do not know okay coming to our extensions we have two very important extensions uh, the first is just uh, uh, the first is that uh, these relationships uh, people in these relationships become extremely skeptical of these relationships and they start doubting at every step and the second is that the insecurities of some people who have had bad relationships increases many fold let's take them one by one understand uh, uh, taking the first extension understand what are relationships based on right now in our in our paradigm uh, in the status quo understand that they're based on the aspect of trust and irrational love right you believe that you trust the other person you might have your own insecurities you might have your own weaknesses but at the end of the day you believe that no matter just how worse things get i will f- i will have this one person to fall back upon that no that might not be true in most of the cases but this is how relationships are based on and you think that uh, no matter just how irrational my partner is i will once again be there for this for this person so that we can go through these tough times right understand that now that we have established uh, that now we have a quantity uh, which we can't really understand the extent of its importance uh, there are going to be two reasons why we are extremely going to be skeptical about this the first one is going to be uh, the person who is in a relationship will start thinking uh, about if they've experienced all the pleasure that they have have i experienced everything just how much is left for me and uh, also uh, if i have experienced everything am i wasting my time here is there any other good relationship out there for me to go and pursue when these things start coming uh, your uh, your primary reason for being in a relationship that is to be with this one person get some pleasure be their support system it all goes out of the window because now you're thinking about other relationships whether this relationship actually has any benefit for you left and if you can leave it and go and take another relationship where you can get more pleasure however the second point uh, another reason why you'll be extremely skeptical for this is because you will start believing uh, you will start thinking about your own partner thinking whether they have experienced everything as well and what if they have are they going to leave me tomorrow or uh, or am Am I have I given them all the pleasure that they have to receive? What should I do? Should I hold on to it a bit more? There are a lot of issues with this. Uh, any POIs from Oji? Okay, none. So uh, this is where we differentiate ourselves from opening opposition. They just come and state for you. Uh, that uh, well uh, there people are going to be extremely skeptical the mechanism and the re- the way in which they are going to be skeptical this is what we give you right and uh, the coming to the second extension why insecurities will increase understand that if a person goes through a series of bad relationships uh, what it is going to do is this is going to tarnish the self worth and they are going to localize fault for themselves right this is once again how uh, we differentiate ourselves from opening opposition opening opposition says that oh people uh, who have had bad relationships will now start feeling high and mighty they will not want to change themselves and they will be locked out of relationships true that is true for only egoistic people but for but in a majority of cases what happens is that when you had bad relationships usually you start thinking oh maybe it was my fault that something like this happened maybe it was uh, your insecurity start coming into the picture and you start believing that maybe i wasn't as polite uh, uh, as i had to be maybe i wasn't as caring and all these things start happening now when you have when you had a lot of relationships like this one after another you start becoming more and more insecure and insecure it is become exasperated because now you're thinking that no matter what happens i am the reason why i'm getting these low score pleasure relationships in the first place and this locks you out because now you're completely locked in this bubble where you believe that you're not supposed to have any relationships with anyone at all there are a lot of problems with this people will have people's lives and the relationships will completely be ruined we do not want that we're extremely proud to oppose
involved with to conclude from the government side. Hello, am I audible? Yep, you are. All right, cool. Panel, a couple of months ago, my ex-girlfriend left me because she said that we are in different stages of our lives and that we are incompatible. Although I managed to recover okay because I'm, as what Sarish mentioned, a fuckboy, what the difference is, many people in this world may not recover as easy as I did. Many people will be living with that trauma for years to come. Many people will be afraid to get into relationships. And these are the important stakeholders that we are protecting in this debate. And this can only happen in our world and we are protecting these people and this is who we stand for. I'm going to structure my speech using the failures of each and every team. First, I will deal with opening opposition shouty bucket list of under-analyzed one-liner arguments. Second, I'll show you why CO didn't really have a case. And last, I'll show you why Sarish arguments carry a heavier weightage and grounding in this debate compared to our opening's somewhat average attempt at running a case with large lacunas and missing impacts. First, on OO shouty under-analyzed one-liner argu one argument. The first thing to point out was the entire case predicates on one premise, right? That the metric of uh, the metric of pleasure is one that's subjective and it's objective uh, and it's not objective. Couple of flaws with this argument. First, I think if your entire case predicates on the idea of the mechanism that's fiatted in a debate not being able to, to be like executed, A, we don't know what's the debate, what then the debate is going to be about. But B, even if you take them at the very best case scenario, and these are things that Sarich already told you, is that at the point where everything is so subjective, a slight amount of objectivity is more important so we can actually evaluate people's experiences better. I'm going to bring you what Sarich told you and directly clash with this case. I'm going to tell you why having a fully romantic relationship, i.e. you're not able to understand other facets of a relationship, is inherently risky. Two main principal reasons why this is so. First, understand what happens when an entire relationship is uncertain. You're not going to have fun and experience the joy of discovering relationships like the entire audience want to push forward, but rather it's a threat to your emotional well-being because of two things. First, it gives massive power to the other player to manipulate yourself. Meaning that at the point where all your happiness and all your well-being is heavily predicated on what the other person sends or what the other person you assume the other person to be, it becomes far easier for the other person to manipulate you. Many of the impacts that Sarish already brought to you that far outweighs of our opening government case, things like your abuse. Okay, OO's only response, or all, the entire objection is like, ah, look, these are all worst case scenarios. It is precisely because these are the worst case scenarios people that we need to protect these people even more because they are the most vulnerable people in this debate. The second reason why in fully romantic relationships are inherently risky is because oftentimes they are so strong that people cannot effectively control or regulate it in the same way that we can regulate other emotions. What's the tangible impact of this? Are things like, for example, you're not willing to get into relationships ever again. You ne never trusting, female never ever trusting men again. The reason why relationships and love is so risky is because these are things that we cannot rationalize and cannot control with our own, like, own mindset. Therefore, we think it's far better when we have a fair metric for you to, uh, for you to measure this. The comparative is, at the point where you can measure, in our worst case scenario, maybe it's only in numerical forms. So we think it's far better because we have a far, we have a yardstick for you to evaluate what kind of relationship you want to get into. The second thing that they told you was, ah, look, now people become very worried about relationship. What if I'm in a relationship, but my score is very low with the other person? I'm always going to be very worried that he'll abuse, abuse me every day. I think this doesn't take a rocket, a rocket science genius to understand. I think even my kid that I'm coaching would understand this mechanism. A, you can evaluate how a person treats you based on your day-to-day -day interaction. If a person is always nice to me, I think it's unlikely that he'll abuse me. B, if the score is very low, i.e. if it's a 1 to 10 skill and I see this girl having a 1 skill, I will probably not even get into a relationship in the very first place. We don't understand why any of the argument really stands. If they want to claim abuse happens on both sides of the house, which we do not, like, we don't concede that that's actually true, but even in our worst case scenario, abuse happens far less in our world where people get into relationship less periodically. We think that they have more barriers of entry to relationships. We think people in India, for example, won't be, like, fall for people, fall for different guys and get abused in the long run. The third thing that you tried to shout and assert was, Ah, uh, look, people with one point also got a lot of value. You cannot downplay that. Couple responses. First, just because somebody is a one-pointer to me doesn't mean he's a one-pointer to another person, right? He could be a ten-pointer to another person, meaning that he adds more value to the other player. Everything is far better because your relationship becomes more meaningful, more pleasurable, and more happy. You think that's net good. Two, we think even if you want to go for one-pointer, um, yes, the, the numeric number gives a set like a barrier of entry, but we think ultimately at the point where you still have your day-to-day -day interaction, you understand the person better, that still far outweighs any numeric values since opening opposition want to claim that these numeric values is subjective as best. At the point where you realize that none of OO's argument doesn't really make sense, and all he did was spend seven minutes shouting, we think OO takes a hard fall. 
The second I'm going to deal with CEO's sec, uh, missing arguments. If you really check your notes, right, CEO says nothing. They spend seven minutes telling you what? Ah, this mechanism is very subjective, cannot debate. I think, right, at the point at you are the last speaker of the debate and your only case is ah, very subjective, cannot debate. I don't think they deserve to A, be in the top room, but B, even win this debate. But let's just take them at the very best case scenario where they, are, they claim that they have an extension, which is like, oh, now people will also duck at every step of the way. Understand this exactly the same as what OO says, right? And besides everything I already told you as to why like, this doesn't really make sense, but okay, even in our worst case scenario where you doubt every step of a relationship, I think that's fine. I think you make better and more meaningful relationships because you are more cautious of every step. We think it's better. We think it's perfectly okay for you to be more selfish and for you to be more self-defensive and to, for you to take care of your own interests in every relationship. We don't think every relationship is a 50-50 thing. It is fine to protect yourself insofar as you believe that love is something that's scary. We think love is something that will hurt you for a long run. Uh, I'll take OO. Uh, preemptive mechanisms exist on both sides of the house prior to opting into a relationship. Your, private, your premise is that a score of five tells me that my significant other might sexually assault or attack me. Why is that the case? It just tells me I might be moderately happy without telling me why yeah, or yeah, how. Yeah. So just because you've got five out of ten doesn't mean the person will be a sexual predator, right? Pleasure comes in a myriad of forms. Maybe she's not going to buy me handbags like why you want to claim so much. Maybe she's not going to hug me every day and the kind of pleasure and love that I have. Understand that the metric of pleasure is not stagnant. It's one that fluctuates from people to people depending on the individual's interest and the individual's perspective on pleasure. We think your case and you are already out of this bit. I think what's more important is also, this also like Kinsey ties in what Sari told you, right? Is if you create a self-correcting uh, mechanism, meaning you're always going to search for better alternatives and we're going to search and not settle for less, meaning that you will never want to set, meaning that you always find your one true love and never settle for less. Everything is perfectly fine to be selfish. Last, let me tell you why Sari's case is more, Sari she didn't went, was when fully unresponded by closing opposition and why his arguments are more grounded and should carry the heaviest weightage in this debate. He told you three main ideas. First, the, the idea of protecting the principle of self-defense. No response from closing opposition. Second, he told you why, how this actually, the tangible impacts and practical impacts of how this protects people's interests and relationships as a whole and how it protects women who are really so oppressed in a patriarchal system. No response. Last, he also tell you how we are able to help nicer people find relationships it otherwise wouldn't have in their world where people always fall for fuckboys and people always fall for manipulative, manipulative uh, relationships. Similarly, no response. Panel, our model is not perfect but we provide people with the access to better, more secure, and more meaningful relationships. On all facets of this debate, we are already winning. Extremely proud to propose. Opposition wave to wrap up the debate. Yeah. Hi, hi. I hope I'm audible. Yep, you are. Give me 10 seconds, I'll begin. Starting my speech in three, two, one. I honestly thought in a pro-am, speakers would be much more understanding of other teams and not be dicks and claim that, oh, you don't deserve to be in top rooms. But unfortunately, I think like just debating is filled with dicks and that just proves that hypothesis on a daily basis. There are three questions in this debate. First, how does this move impact the dynamics of a relationship? Second, what are the long-term impacts on personal growth for individuals? And third, what happens in specific abusive relationships? Because that's the burden that CG wanted to push on everyone for some goddamn reason. On the ideas of how like the dynamics of relationships change. Note, no like team and gov bench talks about this at all, right? They say that, oh, you have a number in the beginning of that relationship. You can use that number very effectively to understand what you're going to derive from that relationship. But once you get in that relationship, you forget and you don't give a fuck about that number anymore. Right? I'm extremely unsure why that's likely. Opening opposition tells you th things that I think are valuable but not mechanized. Where in DLO, they tell you how there's going to be some amount of anxiety on a daily basis because of this number existing. Note, we mechanize this in member of OP and like GovWip just fails to respond to that apart from like shaming my teammate. Right? We tell you that like these relationships are likely to be riddled with anxiety for three reasons. The first thing is that people can't fucking interpret absolute values, i.e. the way that you look at pleasure right now is relative. I derive some amount of pleasure from an ice cream. I derive more pleasure from a burger. I can compare a burger and ice cream because that's relative. I don't know how that's likely or how that's going to happen in their world, given that this calculation only happens as one holistic number, not comparing to what is happening on the day to day of these individuals, which means it's going to be extremely 
like tough for people to be interpreting this number note this is not fucking fiat learn the definition of fiat and then come to debate then i think even assuming that individuals will have some measure of interpreting this i think there are two problems that exist that anurag speaks to you the first problem is that you can't calculate how much pleasure is left in that relationship which means on a day to day basis you are going to question is the pleasure that i'm supposed to derive over or not am i getting more pleasure today than tomorrow that is something that's going to wreck people's life and wreck the point of relationships which is being irrationally in love but second you don't know how much pleasure is left for the for your partner given that in most cases the understanding of pleasure is extremely personal and people are going to get different scores to that extent you're going to continuously question has my partner like finished the amount of pleasure that they wanted to get from this relationship are they going to leave me tomorrow note obviously these insecurities exist in status quo we think these insecurities are largely inflamed in gov's world like dynamics of relationships are destroyed in their world on personal growth and like the long term opening government tells you that happiness will increase as you will be able to recalibrate expectations reasonably and learn from some magical analysis by some sort of dashboard that reflects qualities again i think oh and my py points out that that's balls four reasons why it's unlikely that people will be able to recalibrate expectations the first analysis of why like understanding or interpreting this number is going to be difficult because it's absolute versus relative ideas second a holistic number doesn't in, like indicate anything as like opening opening spoi to govwip indicated as well which is that you don't know if you're going to be assaulted in a relationship if your number is low or high you may just not like the emotional intimacy that you may gain from that relationship which is what is dictating your number third the possibility of any sort of evolution for new or based on newer experiences which may change your mechanisms of how you derive pleasure are some, something that is completely taken away which means your expectations aren't going to be reasonable and fourth the fucking opt out existing in government's world is the like the largest problem i think in their or largest loophole in their case which is that if people are likely to opt out in this i'm unsure as to why they are going to recalibrate their expectations given og's framing of how in status quo when you are opting into relationships you think everything is brilliant you think everything is flowery to that extent i just think like it's going to be extremely difficult to recalibrate these experiences CJ tells you that people in status quo are scarred and don't enter future relationships. Note again this is predicated on you being able to have the ability to opt into relationships on being interpreting this number. I don't think they prove that that's likely, but more importantly I think like the worst burden that they wanted to throw on us is something that they don't solve for as well because after any fucking relationship you're going to be scarred because you lose a partner that you were in love with for at least some extent i think the amount of scarring that's going to happen is still going to be more or less the same because of how you can't interpret a fucking number i think people are still likely to be scarred they don't solve anything in their world opening opposition in this regard does a good job when they tell you that oh people are likely to not grow or change their behavior i think this is fair but i think this is extremely unlikely and would probably only impact those egoistic maniacs and fucktards or fuck boys other people would call it who don't want to actually change their behavior what we tell you in co is probably more impactful and this is the way in there right we think people are extremely insecure in the way that they live we think these insecurities are likely to get further explain uh, like further and inflamed especially those who continuously see lower like scores of like the pleasure that they're going to derive from relationships we think humans in general are so insecure that they like localize all sorts of blame on themselves we think the localization of this blame is likely going to be much worse which means that now at a point at which i see i'm going to get a 3 with this person 4 with this person or 2 with that person i'm not going to blame the other people i'm more likely going to blame myself because there are significant problems in the way that i behave i think this is not and i don't think this leads to constructive behavioral changes because i think that would be something that would exist in status quo as well i think this the, like the large or the likely implication of this is that the insecurities like or these individuals continuously don't just get locked out of relationships as oh want to tell you but these individuals are no longer happy because they think that they are at fault they continuously blame themselves and have no incentive to want to change like government does not mechanize that on abusive relationships og and cg tell like og tells you individuals will have realistic expectations i took that down cg tells you that women are likely to not opt into like abusive relationships and they want to use prevention i think there are a lot of responses in anurag speech which they just ignore right the their framing of security is weird right we prove to you that in the most patriarchal societies women anyway don't have the ability to access a lot of technology and access their agency which means that the worst take holder is not getting helped on either side but more importantly i think 
and this is our material on interpretability right og concedes that courtship periods are going to be deceiving we think people entering into toxic relationships usually avoid precursors because of the way that they think these relationships are going to change or their abilities or again things seeming flowery i'm unsure as to why people will not just ignore these as ignore this again as a red flag right i think the and like this is apparent because a lot of individuals continuously get into toxic relationships like uh, in a cyclic manner right i think the reason for that is because of the worst or the bad lived experiences that have continuously inflamed their insecurities given that i've proven to you that these individuals are going to be continuously insecure they're likely going to enter into these bad relationships continuously and then not be or not opt out because they think they won't find another relationship again we think for these individuals the world is significantly worse off and they are more likely to lock themselves into abusive relationships because they think that they're not going to get pleasure because of their past experiences at all we think the the world is significantly worse off in government's world. Extremely proud to oppose. Thank you, everyone, for the speeches. Uh, it's a silent round, so please leave the room.